season four about what we could possibly do for uh, season five and um, I, I just I thought it would be interesting to do an alternate reality story in which Shepard didn't make it into the Stargate program. I know the fans are gonna love seeing uh, Joe Flanagan uh, playing a homicide detective. I think that's a lot of fun and I personally am very excited about shooting in Las Vegas but uh, you know that's why I'm doing it. We had always talked about doing a story about having a wraith on Earth, like what would happen if there was a wraith loose on Earth. And I thought it would be fun if, if uh, we, we did an episode that kind of riffed on that. What if you were you know, flipping channels looking for Atlantis and you thought maybe you were watching the wrong show for a little while, but, but yet there are our main characters. And I had never really seen a lot of, um, uh, of the CSI franchise. I watched a bunch of those. Uh, just to see what it was about, and, and uh, it's it's extremely stylistic the way the way they shoot that that show, and and it, it looks amazing. It was it was a lot of fun to do to to kind of step outside not just the reality of Atlantis, but um, the style of Atlantis to try and emulate a different way of, of filmmaking, and then have it slowly kind of morph into a more traditional uh, Atlantis. Thanks, we Pat. are shooting uh, the uh, motel. It is a motel that's supposed to be in Vegas. It's not the Bellagio. And uh, this is where um, the Wraith has been hanging out. And, uh, and our sick guy, who's been barfing in the bathroom in there, uh, he, he gets exposed to some radiation. Uh, the Wraith is building a device in the trailer. And it's parked next door to this guy's room. And he gets sick because of it. Well, originally we had hoped to shoot in Nevada. We had hoped to take ourselves on the road down to Vegas. And when we ultimately looked at it, we realized not only could we not afford the four days, but um, we probably couldn't afford three. So we looked at opportunities to emulate that desert look up here where we could take our crew and, uh, and maybe get more uh, time out of that, that money. So. We drove out, all, all over BC is, is about two and a half, three hours from Vancouver and it's an interesting little pocket of, uh, you know, territory because it, it's actually a desert uh, in the middle of BC. It's the driest place in Canada and the only place where we could even come close to getting that sort of scrub desert look that you get outside um, uh, outside of Las Vegas. I might have to lose a sweatshirt now. Well, starting to get, starting to get toasty. Uh, this is the tease, uh, tease of the episode in which uh, we reveal that Shepard, in this reality, is a detective and that he's on a case that he believes is a, is a serial killer. And the final reveal, we'll be looking back this way and uh, and when you see it, there won't be a mountain there. It'll be uh, hey, Las Vegas. So you know, know. It was absolutely perfect in the morning. It was beautiful. Uh, you can actually see the sky is completely clear blue. The first shot up we did was the um, crane down shot over the, the teaser scenario. You've got a, a, an ambulance and some cop cars and stuff. And the very first shot is, is uh, you know, clear blue. So we got that shot, it was great. And, and about an hour later, the wind started to pick up and it was unbelievable. It's the dust, it blows up, because we're in a desert, you see, so there's sand over there. And you know, they got this thing here, they got this contraption here. This is so I can actually see what people are, what we're shooting. And in order to see it, I gotta stick my face in here like this. So I look really cool doing that, don't I? Dust proof and wind proof and sun proof. And cool proof, too, it's cool proof. The, the sand was just, blowing in gusts, you had it in your eyes, you had it in your face. People were, you know, pulling their hoods over their faces or wearing bandanas and, and uh, it was like we were shooting in a desert sandstorm in, you know, God knows where. It was probably one of the toughest shooting days that I've ever experienced. I think I have a pound of sand in this eye. 
it, it's the sort of thing that's a lot of fun to talk about now because it was a great, ex you know, a gr one of those great stories, great experiences, but uh, it was not a lot of fun at the time. We had this massive explosion. I had wanted to do it early so that we had the opportunity of pushing it if weather or uh, other circumstances had, had jeopardized it. The trailer, we had two trailers. We had a, um, uh, a film trailer that we, would, that we could go in and out of that looked really good. And then we had one that had been cut up into small pieces and taped back together with duct tape, believe it or not, uh, that was painted silver. And, and then that one was rigged with explosives. Like, I don't even know, you'd have to ask Ray how many gallons of gas were in that thing. I've done the strafing run, it's done now. Okay. The truck will be done in a matter of another 15. Then I load the trailer. That'll take 40 minutes and then we push a button. And four, I just need to get this for me before you run away and I run away. For the strafing run, which is this, these guys here and the truck and the trailer, that's a separate, that's a separate entity in itself. At the end of the strafing run, then the trailer goes up, then the truck goes up a beat later. How fast do you want the strafing run? It's coming from a jet pretty yeah, fast. Right. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. The explosion was going to be so big uh, that if there was any amount of wind, they were concerned about A, controlling debris, flaming de debris, getting outside the area that we were uh, trying to contain, but also there were power lines running down the middle of the location. Basically, they just would not have let us explode the trailer if there was any danger whatsoever of, uh, you know, of interaction with the power lines. One of the biggest challenges in prepping that explosion was I was assisting um, Ray Douglas and, and his crew in um, attempting to get all the crew to a safe position. And uh, we wanted to make sure everybody had some cover um, over their heads and in the back of a truck and not on any tailgates or they were far enough away that they didn't need any cover because everybody wanted to watch. Actually, to be honest with you, I always find these sort of things somewhat anticlimactic because there's so much buildup and so much talk about it. And then it's over in like a matter of seconds. It's just, there it is. And it looks great and you watch it on film in slow-mo and you think, oh, that's awesome. But the actual act of filming it is incredibly quick it's just boom and it's over and then everybody's you know clapping and patting themselves on the back hopefully it's just like christmas yeah christmas or sex yeah we got a fire over here maybe someone wants to put that out i remember hearing that on the radio it was uh you know because it, it was it was cardboard and and uh stuff that was going to look like it was metal but flying all over the place and we kind of came out out of the trucks to view the aftermath and we saw Ray and uh, Scott walking sort of slowly over to the to the burning debris and then all of a sudden they just turned around and started walking the other way very purposefully and you don't usually see them do that they're usually in pretty quickly and and they've got their uh, fire extinguishers going and and uh, and we're standing there and all of a sudden I hear over the radio that you know uh, something had not gone off uh, one of the cans had not had not blown and and we were not that far from that from that area and just, just boom this this another secondary huge explosion went off and I was standing right beside Joe Flanagan and a piece of burning debris went you know probably 50 feet over our heads but went flying across the entire clearing it was uh, it was pretty scary we could we could have easily been uh, been in the line of fire you can't really replicate that with visual effects. It's, um, you use visual effects in those sequences to do things like put your characters, you know, close to the explosion. I think there's a great shot where it looks like Joe Flanagan is, you know, sitting up against a car as the trailer goes up. And, you know, obviously he wasn't there. We shot that uh, uh, separately so it could really be him and, and not put a stuntman in jeopardy and then you just you don't marry the two together. That day we got some great shots with Joe Flanagan diving over the Camaro and, and Swiss cheesing that up with squibs and, and just all the stuff blowing on around and blowing up around him. And the actors, Neil and Joe, just were fantastic. Just were game for anything. We put a gun in their hand, they'd do whatever they were told, we'd blow up their bodies, they'd no problem. They're just like so into making this episode look fantastic. It's a big episode and yet it's not a big sci-fi episode. I mean, it's, it was quite expensive, but yet, you know, the cost came from things like going on location. After finding the wind and sand, 
we headed to Las Vegas. Well, we're at the uh, Planet Hollywood Resort and Casino in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. We were very, very fortunate to hook up with Planet Hollywood, who did a, it was very, very cooperative and, and, and was enthusiastic about us doing pretty much everything that we really wanted to do. The fact that it has this mezzanine level, a lot of the hotels don't have this high a ceiling in the casino, and it's one of the things that makes it so um, film friendly is because you can set your lights and you have this tremendous view out of, uh, out over the balcony. A lot of times in casinos, the ceilings are, are you know, 12 foot ceilings, so the lights are right there on top of you, and there's really nowhere to put your camera to look down on it, or or just see the whole the whole spread as you can. You really don't have a lot of control. It's a, it's one of those situations where you know it's a lot of good things and a lot of bad things can happen. The good things are that you you end up with a ton of production value. It looks like we had a million extras uh, that day. We were only controlling the immediate uh, traffic around the wraith, and um, you know the rest was that was the public. And you know you 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 really hope you don't get a couple of. Uh, you know, goofs waving at the camera or, or jumping up and down and, and uh, or interfering with you in some way that, that negatively affects your shot. Um, well, for me, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of people who were corralling, uh, you know, the public, trying to make sure that they didn't walk through our shot or uh, wave at us. And, you know, hey, what you doing? You making a TV show here? It's not that complicated a sequence. We're basically just running, you know, running our way through the casino. Uh, this is a little music montage as he makes his way uh, through the hotel and up to the suite where, where he's going to be playing the card game. But we really wanted to feature kind of the flavor of Vegas and being inside a casino. And, uh, you know, we, we went to all the trouble to come down here, so we wanted to actually, you know, shoot some stuff on the floor. Uh, it was important to me to get shots of the Wraith walking down the Las Vegas Strip and, and seeing him interact with crowds. And, those things kind of, to me, help to sell the uh, slightly ridiculous scenario of having a, a, a wraith uh, participating in a high-stakes poker game. The, the poker game is made up of quite a colorful you know, group of, of characters. Down at one end is uh, uh, Charlie Cohen, who is the executive VP of MGM. He's a huge fan of the show and, you know, is greatly responsible for the fact that we were shooting in Vegas. Uh, next to him is um, Joel Goldsmith, who uh, writes our, uh, our music. He's been a composer uh, for uh, as long as, as uh, Stargate has been on the air. And then there's two professional players. And then, uh, uh, you know, we had a couple of the, a couple of the gentlemen, uh, Steve Strippa and uh, Frank Vincent, who, who you may recognize from The Sopranos. They were great guys, super professional. They were, um, you know, really, uh, you know, excited to be there. And when you're writing a scene like that, and you know that you've got a couple of guys like that coming in for a cameo, you know, you're kind of torn. On the one hand, you know, you want that scene to be to be worthy of their talents, um, but on the other hand, it is just a cameo. So, uh, you, you know, you want that show to almost to be all about them. It's kind of funny. I had written a different scene, and I wasn't that happy with it. And heard uh, Joe Flanagan talking about a situation in which um, uh, his nanny's finger had actually been bitten off by, by one of her dogs. She had, they had all been a, at a, an outdoor uh, uh, campfire at, at Joe's place and the dogs got into a bit of a fight and she had reached in to try and, and uh, break it up and one of the dogs actually bit the tip of her finger off and he told that whole story and I thought you know that is that is that is just too good to be true you just can't you just can't make stuff like that up and uh, so I, I rewrote the scene and put that story I embellished it to a certain extent but that's the uh, dialogue that that Frank and uh, uh, Steve actually deliver in the show. You got it in the fridge and where's the housekeeper? It's at the hospital. She lost a ton of blood. Really? Don't they need the finger? Nah, it's too late to reattach it. Should be all right. Anyway. Yeah, we've, we've stopped there. We've cut. You don't look good when you smile. That's good. You look more evil when you smile. Gentlemen, you know what? Yeah, we were down in a hallway of, of uh, a service hallway of, of a working casino hotel. So there were still staff walking through. Um, 
It was uh, one of the first first things we had to do stunt-wise down in uh, down in Vegas. It was a little more chaotic working down there. There's always like somebody walking in the way or something, and I just had to be more sort of um, on top of things. Uh, just people that you're used to working with know your style, they know when you're rehearsing, they know when you're not. And all the shooting crew came from LA, so there was only a couple of us from Vancouver here that were actually, had been on Stargate Atlantis from the beginning. When you're down there and you don't know anybody and you're like, okay, well, I want to need, oh, hold on. Uh, who's the props guy? Somebody? I hired all the stuntmen from Los Angeles and every one of them I had worked with before on some movie. So I knew that, that I was covered um, no matter what, but there's that variable of working with uh, new people that is always, is always a challenge. I was really set on trying to do an episode that had real elements in it. In the case of the stunt, um, I wanted the Wraith to, to jump off of the casino building. All I had to go on when we were prepping this high fall was um, drawings and uh, they weren't to scale and photographs. I mean, it's very important when you're choosing an airbag for a high fall, you have to know how high the high fall is because airbags are, are um, constructed specifically for, for certain heights. Um, also, I had to know what the width of the alley was that we were working in to place the airbag because the airbag may not have fit in the alley and it may not have been a deep enough alley to jump off um, the roof with. What we have behind me right here is an airbag made for high falls. Um, this one here is rated up to, uh, to 80 feet. Um, it's taken us, it takes about 45 minutes to get this rolled out and blown up and ready to jump in. We've just finished, as you can see down here, just finished marking it. I've had uh, my stunt performer, Andy Dillon, uh, up at the top there, uh, spotting exactly where he wants the bag, and we've shuffled it around to his specs and uh, basically ready to go. What I'm hoping is that uh, he's gonna jump off and look as cool as possible. All of the cool stuff that makes action characters look good is the stunt guys. And the stunt guy is the one that's putting his life on the line to make the character and the shot look as cool as possible. So, I mean, these guys are valuable. I'm, I'm, I'm in continual awe of what they've done. They have a completely different relationship to pain than most people, and uh, they put their bodies uh, on the line. It was a pretty high jump, but I, I also feel very confident in, uh, in James Bamford, our stunt coordinator. So at that point, I kind of say, this is the scenario I want to see happen, and, and I rely on his uh, expertise and you know professionalism to make sure it's gonna it's gonna look good but also that it's gonna come off in a, in a safe in a safe way what uh, what Andy needed to know uh, to, to perform uh, this particular high fall was what I needed from him in the air what Andy's about to perform is called a uh, style of high fall is called a face-off so what he does is he steps off straight off the side of the building one foot off as if he were running from the uh, from the other end of the uh, roof. He steps off and falls down face first. He'll end up flattening out and come down like this, this sort of trajectory, stomach first, like so. And about 10 feet from the bag, he'll spin himself, like so, and end up on his back. We got him up on the roof and uh, he looked at it. We threw a couple um, rehearsal uh, water bottles wrapped in towels over so he could see the trajectory of the, uh, of the fall. And uh, once he saw that and he confirmed uh, that um, the trajectory was fine for him, then he was ready to go. It was unbelievable, like unbelievably skillful. Landed perfectly, dead center, um, no problems, no issues. It was all hugs and, and uh, everybody was happy and then we went on to the next scene. Safety is the key when jumping off a roof. I always feel like, um, you know, the work is, the amount of work is never really reflected in the final episode. Uh, you watch it, it's, it's 42 minutes and, you know, people kind of like it and, and then they forget about it. For the most part, it was, uh, it was really, really easy and, and um, you know, super uh, 
uh, super cool as far as being able to to make it look like you know we were we were in Las Vegas and on the strip and in the casino.